Hello and welcome to my V-Ray 3 for Rhino 6 uh, settings tutorial. Um, this tutorial is intended to go through the general global settings of V-Ray 3 um, to talk about what they mean and get you set up on some settings that work well um, for architectural projects. Um, so it's important to know that these settings are specifically designed for V-Ray 3 and Rhino 6. Um, they do not work the same as old V-Ray 2 and or V-Ray 3 for Rhino 5. So keep that in, in mind. This is the latest build of both uh, programs. So to get started, let's go to the asset editor. So under your V-Ray icons here, it's this um, V-Ray logo. If you click on that, you can see we have the, um, the V-Ray toolbar. Um, the default here is this gear wheel, which is all of your settings. So these are all of your global settings. Um, so we'll run through these and kind of what they mean and why they're important. Um, the next icon over are your um, V-Ray geometries, which we'll get to in a later tutorial. Um, V-Ray lights, uh, we'll get to this tutorial to, in a later tutorial where we discuss um, scene lighting. Um, and then finally, the materials, and this is where you create materials. If you pull out this bar to the left, there's all, all these preset materials. Um, but and we'll get to a, um, a material tutorial as well, where we cover all those. So for now, let's just look at our, um, our global settings. So the default settings are shown here. Um, I'm gonna kind of explain a few and then we're gonna edit some to get them set up for I think what works best for a more architectural rendering. Um, V-Ray is again, as a program is used by many professions to render in many different styles. Um, so what I've tried to develop is uh, settings that work very well for architecture specifically, and also that do a good job about managing um, time and quality because V-Ray can make perfect photorealistic uh, images, but it takes a long time and potentially multiple computers. Um, so for the average architect working on a fairly decent computer, these settings seem to work well. Um, so let's jump in. So first I'm going to turn off the progressive um, toggle here. Um, below that is quality. So this is going to have a great effect on your time overall, but um, is a great way to be able to test things at a low quality and then bump it up to high um, once you feel confident that all your materials and your lighting is correct and you know that it's ready to get the final output. Um, so camera, we're going to skip over that for now. We'll come to that in a later, more advanced tutorial. Um, the default settings are okay for this. Um, so our render output, this is extremely important. Um, the default is set to this 800 by 450. So that's 800 pixels wide by 450. Um, so what we'd like to do is um, come down to this aspect ratio, which is set to a standard 60 by nine. And so I don't want a 16 by nine. I actually want to drop down and change this to match my viewport. So I think it's more important to match what you're seeing in your um, Rhino window. So now it's going to match the proportions of everything I see here. And when I hit render, if I see it here, it'll come up in the um, view. So that said, if I change something here, if I wanted to make it bigger, a thousand pixels wide, I put type in a thousand here, and it automatically changes my height because it's keeping the proportions of my view frame. Um, save it. Image is super important. If I turn this toggle on, um, what that'll do is as soon as the rendering is done, it'll automatically save it to the file path, which you can just put in here um, and put it wherever you'd like to save it. Uh, this is really great when you do a big rendering or you let something render overnight and the rendering finishes, but then your computer decides to do updates and closes it and you lose the whole thing. Um, this will solve that by just saving it immediately. Um, it's happened to me a lot of times, so it's been a lifesaver. Um, environments, again, this is something once we start setting up our scene lighting, we'll get into more detail here. Uh, material override is a great tool for quickly, if I turn this toggle on, essentially what it'll do is it'll override all of our materials. So if I have a 
concrete wall or brick siding and some metal or what in, in this glass. Um, it'll turn everything into like a nice light gray here as sort of a clay rendering while I can come in and, and focus more on getting my lighting and my scene lighting, getting all my shadows, things like that that I don't need to look at the material for. I can very quickly set up while this is all overridden. Um, I can also change it to a specific material. Right now there's nothing to choose from because I don't have any materials made, but just a kind of standard light gray is usually fine. Um, for your override, and it, it speeds things up so you can focus on one thing at a time. Um, it's, 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 it's essential in V-Ray to not be trying to edit too many things at once because one, it'll take forever, and two, all the variables um, affect each other, so it's nice to kind of limit your variables and, and do one thing at a time to fine-tune um, your rendering to where you want it. Um, so over here, all of these settings are sort of our render engine settings. Um, and right now, I want to focus on the global illumination render engines. So I want my primary rays. The default is brute force. I'm going to actually change this to a radiance map. Um, and my, for my secondary rays, I'm going to change this to brute force. So these are actually going to give me um, setting a, a look that I think is a nice, crisp, look for architecture projects and will not um, totally blow it up is from a time standpoint. Um, another thing I want to do is just turn the ambient occlusion on. Um, again, I don't, need to, don't want to get into the weeds about what all of these mean um, from a concessional standpoint, um, mostly because it's, you know, it gets to a technical level of really understanding, you know, light physics. Um, and computer science that I don't think is totally necessary, but I've kind of done my own personal testing and I've sort of landed on the, this combo as, as the best way to get an, an output. Um, the last thing I want to talk about are the render elements. So if I drop down here, it says add render elements. Um, I can, if I just click here, this list will pop up and these are all the different types of outputs I can get. So one of the things I always like to put here is my material ID um, because beyond my rendering giving me just the finished product, it'll also give me a material ID, meaning that every material I have will be rendered in a solid block color. So it almost becomes a paint by numbers output um, that comes with your rendering and it makes selection in Photoshop much easier. So I just keep that selected. Um, in a later tutorial, we'll come back to that and see how, how that affected it and why it's important. Um, so and before we are finished with kind of running through all these, I just want to talk conceptually about the difference between the dimensions and the quality. Um, so dimensions are going to be more important for your final output, meaning that if you're going to be printing this on large format boards, you're going to want to knock this up into the five to 6,000 range to make sure your DPI is correct and you don't lose quality. Um, whereas the quality here is going to be the settings that in which it renders. So if you see if I have this on low, if I change this to medium and high, you can see it's reducing my noise limit. It's changing the, some of the settings in my radiance map settings. Um, this is going to be basically adding more detail and more accurate light bouncing. Um, things like that. Reflections are going to look better. So the quality is going to, is going to do what it says and it affects the quality of the image, um, but it's going to work in with the size. So low quality and low size will be fast. Um, when you get this high and this high, it gets very fast. Um, occasionally, if you're only going to be projecting this um, or maybe an 11 by 17 printout, you can get away with moving up this up high and keeping this as small as 2000 um, to keep your time there. But these are going to be working tandem for your timing. Um, and while the size is sort of a linear in how much uh, time it adds, meaning if it's 1000 wide and you can bump it up to 2000, it'll take about twice as long. The quality settings, when this is goes from low to high to medium, is more of an exponential time increase. So if your low render setting is taking 10 minutes 
and the medium's taking an hour, high could take three hours. Um, so keep that in mind when you're running through these um, and so that you're not wasting time um, with your settings. Um, so now that we have these set up, um, these will be locked into our Rhino model. They won't change, so if I close out of here, I come here, do some work, save it, open it a week later on a different computer, go to my asset editor, all of these settings will be saved. Um, that said, you can always load uh, settings as well. So if you get if you have these in here and you like them, you can save them. So you can save them as um, you know starter, or I have some as dusk and perfect day, some various settings that I've done over the years. You can save those, um, and then when you open up a new project, you can just click here to load your render settings, and you can just click on your setting, click open, and it'll open it up, and all the things will change. Um, back to here, and you can see that various settings with some minor tweaks, um, and they all come back in, even down to the last time I used the setting, I had 4,500 image width, um, and I was rendering it high, this must have been a final product. Um, so that's the way to set those up, um, also to save them and load them into new files if you need to, and um, that'll be it for today, thanks.